Paul Gronke is a professor of political science and director of the Early Voting Information Center, EVIC, at Reed College in Portland. Professor Gronke studies American politics specializing in convenience and early voting, election administration, and public opinion. EVIC searches for nonpartisan solutions to identify problems in election administration that are backed by solid empirical evidence. Professor Gronke was recently selected as a 2020 Andrew Carnegie Fellow to conduct research on the stewards of democracy, how local election officials and local election administration can help to offset declining faith and legitimacy in our democratic system. He's a really big deal in election time, and we are incredibly lucky to have him with us now, right as elections are underway. Paul, we know you're in high demand, grateful that you've taken the time to be here with us, and I'm gonna hand the floor over to you. Thanks a lot, Christine. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, of course, I want to start by asking you, Christine, how you're doing. Hang in there. I know you have a new child at home. I hope everything is safe and healthy. You're a Metro counselor. So how are you juggling those responsibilities? Oh, um, there you go. Unmuting. One of the key things we've learned. <laughs> One of the things I've learned, but other than that, things are going really well. Yes, I have a 16 week old child. Um, I'm involved with uh, some elections here in the Portland area and uh, balancing it all from my dining room table. And, uh, you know, we're, we're readies. We know how to read and sleep and get to it. So, um, or not sleep. Well, yeah. thanks so much, Christine. Yeah. And thanks, everyone. I'm really uh, pleased to be here. I'm sorry I can't um, meet you all in person. You know, it's a wonderful fall weekend here. I think we might be having our last little bit of sun before the trees start to change color. We get a little rain uh, and you know the forest fires are over. Uh, and we're looking forward, I think, to making it through this semester and making it through this year. I know the alumni have pitched in as everyone has pitched in to try to help the students and kind of navigate through this very difficult period. Um, so what I'm going to talk, I'm going to try to master all this technology. So what I'm going to be talking about today um, is uh, the, uh, a lot of the work that I've been doing um, in, at the Early Voting Information Center, um, the work that we've been doing, I'm gonna re review in a lot of ways, excuse me, review in a lot of ways the work that we've been doing um, over the past decade. Um, and with some focus on 2000 and uh, 2020 right at the end, I'm gonna start by walking in, um, you know, talking about this election crucible. What I mean by that is, um, really, we, we have just been drinking from the fire hose for the last six months, um, really trying to triage and stay on top of things. Um, so I'm going to walk through um, some of our work uh, that we've been doing. If you want to know more about us, um, you can go to evic.read.edu. Um, that will provide you um, some insights into the work that we've been doing. There's some resources there um, to learn about our research, uh, some of our policy materials, um, and you can get a sense of, of our, um, the team that works with me. So um, what I'm going to talk about today in brief, I'm going to um, try to give you a sense about the challenges of doing work in this field, um, the uh, kind of what you have to wrestle with and why it takes a combination of really um, high quality social science and re really high quality data science um, to try to make inferences, to try to help policymakers, citizens, advocates, uh, and election administrators understand um, the consequences and outcomes of some of the decisions that they make. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. I'm going to try to provide a little bit of audience participation um, via the chat. Um, that's going to be mostly me. I ask a question, see if people can come up with the answers, and then I'll provide the answer. Um, but talk a little bit about specifically um, automatic voter registration um, and what that is um, and how we try to evaluate the impact of automatic voter registration on the on the, um, the makeup of the rolls and on voter turnout. And then a little bit of sense of drinking from the fire hose. I'm gonna go through in a very rapid a flurry of, of projects that we were involved in in 2020. And I'm gonna to try to leave a lot of time, at least a half an hour if I can, looking way up at the clock there um, for Q and A. So uh, give me my counterfactual, why we need good social science and good data science to help us understand the impact of election administration. So uh, for those of you, you all know this, but just to remind you, the American election system is, is sort of radically decentralized because of the impact of American federalism. Um, so there's a highly diverse set of policies, procedures, practices um, across the many jurisdictions in the United States. 
Um, we know historically, um, going all the way back to the beginning of the Republic, that uh, most of the change in our system is driven by political competition um, and by political crises. And these are the situations where we see change. And we're really in the, in the midst of a rapid change period right now. It's very likely post 2020 that we're gonna be facing another um, series of legislative changes across the many states in response to COVID and in response to um, some of the crises that we're facing right now in our election system. Um, this sort of decentralization um, and federalism has had many impacts for the way we try to understand election integrity, um, the way we try to understand um, uh, equal protection and voting access in this country, and the way we think about teaching it to a new generation of scholars and uh, advocates and policymakers and sort of many implications for, um, for the way we think about things. Okay, so y'all know there's gonna be an election um, uh, in, uh, on November 3rd. Um, apparently there's only 48 states in this map. Um, and so some of you are gonna be paying attention to the final result, right? The result, but you'll know that there's not just uh, one election occurring, there's actually 50 separate elections in the 50 states. Um, but it's even more complicated than that. Um, there are over 3,000 counties in the United States, and each of these counties um, conduct their own election in a way. They have an election administrator, and that administrator um, follows state law, follows federal law, but it's, it has a lot of autonomy at, at that local level. Um, and I'm going to turn the focus on one state, uh, the great state of Wisconsin. And I focus on Wisconsin because I just want to drill down a little bit and show you some even additional levels of complexity. So here's w Wisconsin counties. But some of you may know that in Wisconsin, they don't actually conduct elections at the county level. They conduct it at the township or, or municipality level. So there are 1,500 separate election administrators in Wisconsin alone. Um, and actually nationwide, there are over 10,000 individual local election officials that are getting ready to conduct an election in the midst of a pandemic um, in what is likely to be one of the most competitive and historically important elections in 50 or 100 years. So um, the election system is complicated because of all of these jurisdictions. It's also complicated because of all of the steps in the process, because of the way we do things in the United States, starting from uh, the, the registration system through the preparation of the voting machines or the voting equipment to the preparation of the ballots to ballot tabulation and finally reporting the results. So you'll find that people that work in this field tend to specialize in one area. Um, the area where I have built my niche over the last 15 or 20 years is in early voting and voting by mail. Um, I don't do a lot of work on registration, although I have moved into that area and we're actually gonna be talking about registration today. I don't do work on tabulation. I don't do work on voting technology and voting machines. There are others that specialize in those areas. So, you know, if you're going to ask me a voting technology question um, in the q and I'm going to let you know that that's not an area where I have a lot of expertise. Um, what's important to understand is that there's different laws, administrative procedures, and human beings involved in each of these steps. And a breakdown in any step um, can potentially disenfranchise voters um, and challenge the legitimacy of the system. And that's why we really have to pay attention to each uh, what we sometimes refer to in the field as the chain of voting and any weak link any weak link in the system can result in disenfranchisement and breakdown. Okay, so now it's, it's your turn. It's your turn to participate. Um, you, you did a thesis once, now you're gonna be doing a thesis again. And so your thesis project is, is your, you've come to me and, and you, you've decided that you're interested in this new system. You're in Oregon at Reed College and you've heard about this new system called automatic voter registration. And, and you believe that automatic voter registration is going to increase voter turnout. Okay, so you come to me in this first, second week of September with this crazy project you've come up with. And I have to ask you a series of annoying questions. This is, we get training on this as faculty. What are the annoying questions that we ask our thesis students? And so question number one is, well, what is it you're studying? I don't understand what automatic voter registration is. Explain this to me. Um, second, you say that automatic voter registration impacts turnout. So let's talk a little bit about what you mean by turnout. I don't understand. And the third is like, how is this going to change the world? Tell me the meaning of life, please. So let's start with what is automatic voter registration? Automatic voter registration um, is in place in 15 or more states, different uh, groups count automatic, count what constitutes automatic voter registration in different ways. Um, 
primarily what happens there is you engage in a transaction with a governmental agency, in most cases the DMV. Um, via that transaction, certain information is collected. If that information is sufficient to demonstrate that you are qualified to be registered to vote, or if you are already registered and you've provided a change of address, that the information, the data that is collected to the DMV is transmitted to another state agency, the voter register, uh, the uh, agency that deals with elections in that state. And if certain, um, uh, if, if the data, if the data elements are complete, um, your registration is altered, changed, updated. Okay. So this is the traditional uh, avenues via which people can get registered to vote. So um, you can register online or use a paper form. You could go to the DMV in the past. That is, prior to automatic voter registration, you still had the opportunity to register at the DMV. And then outside groups might contact you and provide you materials and register you. So I provide you all of that um, because under the new system, this one path registering you to DMV in some sense, you had to proactively say you wanted to register via the DMV. You should have been provided the opportunity. Um, and now you engage in a transaction. And as part of that transaction, it, it sort of automatically happens. Now, I'm providing you this to let you know that this is sort of the current status of the registration file in a state like Oregon. So it's not like everyone is registered via the automatic process. These other paths still exist. So you'll want to think about this when we're trying to evaluate the impact of AVR. We can't just look at the automatic registrants. We still have to account for these alternative paths. The alternative paths are still there. So we've got this complex um, data structure um, with people entering the system via different paths. And we're trying to compare and evaluate their behavior um, at the other end. OK, so what do you mean by turnout? Right, so we've, we've got AVR. Now we have to know your dependent variable. What do you mean by turnout? Um, so um, here's my first audience participation section. So here are three potential metrics for measuring turnout. And if people want to put in the chat session, chat screen, after an automatic registration system, tell me whether these three quantities will increase or decrease. So you can put it in in the chat. I'll wait for a moment and I'll describe each of these quantities as people chime in. So total votes, we could count the total number of votes cast after automatic voter registration is put in place. Okay, you can opt out, that's right. Eva Galenis Rosenbaum, what are you doing here? <laughs> Talk about that in the Q&A. Systems are different. In some systems, it's an opt out. In some systems, it's an opt in. That's a key distinction. So in California, you go to do AVR and you're asked, you can opt in. In, in Oregon, you're automatically registered and then you opt out. Oh, Eva's answering the question. Thanks, Eva. Okay, so, um, so that's one. Second is you could take the total votes cast and you could divide it by the voting eligible population. And the third is you could look at the total votes cast and you could divide it by the number of people that are registered. Okay, so. The total votes cast should increase, will increase, because you've increased the size of people who are eligible to vote. We expect that the people who are traditionally registered will continue to vote, and some portion of the newly registered individuals will also vote. So the total number of votes will increase. The total number of votes divided by the voting eligible population should also increase. But the total number of votes divided by the registered will likely decrease. The reason is, the new incremental people that you've added were people that were previously not registered. And some of those were people who were sort of detached from the political system. They're not very well engaged. They're not very well, well informed. Um, and so that new group is likely to be have lower propensities of turnout than previously. So if you use this bottom indicator, which the Secretary of State of Oregon was initially talking about that when the system was rolling out, and I, along with others, said, wait, that's not the indicator you want to use. Excuse me. You want to use that indicator. Because ultimately, under an automatic system, you're getting more. If we're, we're over 90% registered now as a percent of VEP in, in Oregon. So that's your metric. Your metric now is total votes divided by VEP, not total votes divided by registered anymore. Okay, what's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is 42, and we've gotten that one done. Some people might get that joke, many won't. Okay, um, so now we've, 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 we've settled the basics. Now the question is, does AVR increase turnout? 
And again, audience participation moment. I'm gonna suggest some possible approaches to study this question. You tell me whether these are good or not. Okay, number one, we can compare the turnout level before AVR and after AVR. So we could compare the turnout prior to 2016 in Oregon and the turnout post 2016. Or we could compare the turnout among the traditionally registered with the automatic registered. Are they 42? <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> um, so, and Olga said, don't look at the chat session and I am not. Okay, so are there any problems with these approaches? Right, any problems with doing pre, a pre-post study? Any problems with the traditional registrants versus the automatic registrants? So think about that for a moment. So there are of course problems. The big problem is under the Oregon Motor Voter, under OMB, the population of people who are automatically registered are not the same as traditional. So you can't just compare those two groups. It's not like by registering someone, you turn them automatically into the, tradi the traditional registrants. Okay, and if the differences between the automatically registered group and the traditionally registered group are correlated with turnout, and you just compare those two groups, you're going to attribute causality to OMV when it's actually something else. And so let's look at the differences between these two groups. So this is as of 2016. I'm displaying here the tradition, the age profile of the traditionally registered population and the age profile of the automatically registered population. Surprise, surprise, lots of young people are registered automatically because young people are more mobile. Uh, they tend to be, comparatively speaking, less attached to the political system, so they're less likely to be registered. So the automatic system sweeps up younger people and older people are more likely to be registered. We also know that there's a strong difference, a strong correlation between age and turnout older people tend to turn out more than younger people. So we can't just compare that. Um, also, uh, the automatically registered population live in areas that have uh, on average lower income. Uh, lower income areas, again, tend to be individuals with uh, more mobile addresses, um, less secure housing situations, um, uh, uh, less secure employment situations. And so a variety of reasons are less likely to be registered and less likely to turn out the vote. Last, I'm just going to show you this map. You can find this map in more detail at the Center for American Progress. The, the darker colors on the map, the red, are what we call the hotspots of automatic voter registration. This is precinct level data, um, and it shows areas where we have more comparatively higher levels of, uh, of individuals who are being registered automatically. And so those of you can kind of look at Oregon and look at some of these areas, and some of these areas may surprise you. For example, out east near Ontario, uh, in the uh, central area near Pendleton, why do we have a lot of automatic registrants there? Why do along the coastline we have lots of automatic registrants? So you might think about that and realize that these are different areas in Oregon and they're likely to have different turnout, not just related to the automatic nature of the process. Okay, so I just wanna show you one indicator that um, really shows you the complexity of this. And that is um, looking at comparing the automatic registrants and the non-automatic automatic registrants simply on their partisan uh, partisanship. So when you are registered automatically in Oregon, you get registered and then you're sent a card and that card asks you if you wanna affiliate with the political party. You can fill that card out if you choose to and send it back. So about 85% of the automatic registrants ignore that card. So what we're comparing here is among traditional registrants, the turnout rate among traditional registrants who affiliate with a political party and those who don't. And now the OMV, the, the small percentage, five or 6% who affiliate with a political party and the 85% who don't. And look at these numbers. Under the automatic registrants who affiliate look a lot like traditional registrants, but those unaffiliated, these are individuals who are automatically registered, the card came, they ignored it, did they make an active decision to be unaffiliated? Probably not. They probably just threw the card in the trash. So that's that's this, the major portion of the automatic voter registered population are these unaffiliated individuals. And this fits in with everything we saw in the last couple of slides that by, we brought these individuals into the electorate who were previously um, had low turnout propensities and now suddenly they're in the registered voter pool. So this leaves us with the complexities about OMV. What's our counterfactual? Right? We can't create a world where we randomly expose people to registration or not. And then as those of you who know political science, social science, this is sort of the new institutionalism part of it. As the system is put in place, 
Now we have a bunch of people on the rolls. And because those people are on the rolls, political organizations, politicians like Christine Lewis, find these people. They start contacting these people. And through that contact process, these people might start to look more like the traditional registrants over time. That's sort of what we're trying to watch and see if that happens. Okay, so here's two ways that we've looked at this problem. One is what's called a synthetic control model. So we create a synthetic organ. We take as many uh, uh, indicators about the state of Oregon as we can that we can collect in other states. And we construct a synthetic organ. But the difference is the synthetic organ didn't have automatic voter registration and the real organ did. And then we can compare the trajectory of turnout in our synthetic organ with our real organ. And so that's one set of work that we've done. Um, the second set of work that I'm going to show a little bit, a uh, little bit more on, is uh, we try to get causal leverage via uh, birthdays. So it turns out that there's a relationship between the timing of your birthday and when you register to vote because of the date that your, uh, because your driver's license expires on your birthday. So we're able to create a random. We are able to sort of create a control group by looking at a group of people whose birthday is just before the registration deadline. And that registration deadline is, is their licenses are being renewed just before the registration deadline. So they have to go in. And when they go in, they're automatically registered. And then the people just after the deadline, because the people that are just after the deadline would have had to register, right? So there, we can, we're able to make a control group by, by grabbing people on both sides of this registration deadline. And so, and, and we know that birthdays in this small, it doesn't work if we go backwards with birthdays, but birthdays for this small segment are, uh, are random, except for their, except for the coincidence of the registration deadline. So we're able to use these two um, approaches to get leverage on the question. The, the synthetic control analysis, depending on how we do it, um, indicates uh, anywhere between one and a half percent and and three percent impact of OMB on turnout. That may seem relatively small. I could talk about why that is if we want to in the Q and A. Um, and we have um, this is a slightly different um, a metric that we're using, um, but the indicator for our birthday model is that the probability of turnout is is around ten percent higher turnout because of OMB for that group. Um, and for people who are being registered for the first time, the impact is as high as 30%. Um, that is, OMB contributes, it, it, contrib it makes it 30% more likely that these individuals will turn out. Okay, um, so that's your second thesis project. Congratulations, write it up. The first chapter is due in a couple of weeks. Um, so now drinking from the fire hose edict today, I'm gonna run really quickly uh, through um, through some of the things, the projects that we're working on today. Um, a lot of this is triage, I have to let you know. Um, it's not like we're doing research now. We're just trying to, I, I try to figure out the right metaphor. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm 58 years old. I've been trying to learn to surf. Why the hell, heck, am I doing that? Um, but you know, I just trying to get up on the board and not fall over. And that's what I feel like until November 3rd or after, I'm just trying to stay on the board, not fall over. Um, so one thing that we're doing is uh, the Stewards of Democracy project that uh, Christine uh, referred to. Stewards of Democracy has been funded by the Democracy Fund over the last couple of years. Um, what we're doing is trying to focus on local election administrators, the street level bureaucrats, if you might um, describe them using the sort of classic Lipsky um, uh, description. People who are really at the, at the front lines of, of delivering democracy to voters. Who are they? Why do they do this job? What do they believe? What are their values? Um, I can tell you, for example, that 95%, 95% of local em election administrators in the United States are females. 4,000 local election administrators are elected every four years, two to four years. 4,000 women are elected to office. No one has studied them. What do they believe? They're 98% white. Like, who are they? Excuse me, 98% white, 75% female. I apologize. Um, so who are they? What do they believe? What are their role in making sure that we have a, a, a safe, secure, um, election system. So that's one piece of work. Second piece of work that we've been doing is we have a partnership with the uh, with uh, Secretary of State Bev Clarno's office through Director Steve Trout. We've been conducting a series of polls to try to monitor um, Oregonians' beliefs and sense of um, the uh, integrity um, and security of our own system. Um, so for example, we have some data here that we collected recently that younger people feel most impacted by COVID-19 most insecure, most of the economic impact has been on younger Oregonians, not on older Oregonians. 
but I also happy to report that we measured this in May. We expect to find this again. We're getting getting ready to hit the field actually next week. Um, Oregonians expect express very few concerns um, that COVID-19 is going to impact their ability to cast a ballot under or Oregon's um, vote by mail system. Okay, is this project two? Um, project three. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're apparently gerontologists now. So um, this is a collaborative paper with uh, my colleagues, Paul Manson, Reed College 01, who works with me now as a visiting assistant professor, uh, Jay Lee, Reed College 19, who works with me as a post-baccalaureate fellow, and Canyon Foote, uh, Reed College 20, also working with me as a post-baccalaureate fellow. And so we examined the um, impact of COVID-19 on older voters who are the most vulnerable portion of the population and how COVID-19 might impact their participation. The interesting thing that we argue in this paper is it's less about voting and it's more about poll worker and volunteerism. Um, older Americans make up the vast, vast majority, up to three quarters in many states of poll workers. Um, and if in-person voting is radically reduced, older Americans lose a way that they uh, engage with the political system and the volunteer system via poll working. So how might that play out in the future if we move to different ways of voting? Um, we've sort of lost this, this well of, of volunteerism that, um, that has been a very regular source of participation for older Americans. Um, then we have this uh, position for race. This is some work um, that I've been doing with um, Canyon Foot. Let's see if I can master this quickly. If I don't, I might screw it up and all Ogle's nervous right now. Um, oh, I did. And so I should be on my web page now. So yes, this is our web page. So um, I have a new uh, post-baccalaureate fellow, Canyon Foot, and I was having a difficult time keeping him busy. So I said, look, I want you to learn some GIS analysis. There's this super interesting race going on right now. It was a th mainly a three-way race for a city council seat in May between Sam Adams, ex-mayor, Chloe Daly, incumbent, and Mingus Maps, Reed alum, um, uh, African-American, uh, all running. They had a, almost a three-way split in May. Now, uh, Chloe Daly and Mingus Maps are running in November. And so we did some really cool analyses here. Um, so this is just some precinct relationships of the Sam Adams vote and, you, and the Maps vote. So Adams votes share and Maps's vote share is correlated, but Adams vote share and Udaly's vote share is strongly negatively correlated. So one might expect with Adams out of the race, because he was third, that Maps would pick up some of his votes. But of course, this was only 40% turnout and we're gonna have probably 80 or 85% turnout in November. And we also created some super cool maps. Um, you wanna see where, hold on. See that little green spot down there? What's that? Oh, that's East Moreland. Look, maps, maps crushed in East Moreland. Um, and so you can kind of scroll around here and look at the different precincts in Portland and get a sense about their demographic profile and how they split between these three candidates. So that's just some super cool work that we've been doing um, here at EDIC. Okay, and now I need to go back to my PowerPoint. Excuse me, too much technology. Okay, um, then the next thing we're doing here is uh, Jay Lee um, has just released uh, an R package that is called CPS Vote. CPS Vote provides an easy um, interface um, to a very complicated survey that the federal government collects every two years. Um, and is one of the primary ways that advocates, activists, um, litigators, um, try to evaluate the impact of, of voter registration and election reforms over time. Um, but it's very hard to use and complicated and they end up paying too much money to people like me and others to help them use this data. So we provided a very easy interface for students, teachers to be able to use the CPS. That little graphic on the right um, is just a, a, it displays over time using a ternary plot, the different trajectories that states have followed as they move toward alternative voting and people just like it because it's a fun, neat animation. Um, another thing that we're doing at um, EVIC is I'm, I'm trying to promote the work of some of my uh, colleagues. So Chris Kosky and Paul, Ma Chris Kosky in my department and Paul Manson um, have been taking the lead on something called the Northwest Policy Priorities Project. Um, it is um, a set of surveys and um, investigations we hope to uh, elevate and, and um, amplify the policy concerns of this region um, in the national dialogue, which are often lost. Um, they particularly are focusing um, in these, uh, in these uh, studies on 
um, environmental global climate change, climate change and how it will impact our region. We got some coverage in Oregonian recently. Um, some cool things that found in this survey, uh, you might be happy to hear that um, both Republicans and Democrats in uh, Oregon and Washington are much more likely to say that uh, global climate change is occurring. Um, but um, I, this is a fascinating finding for me. So what we have arrayed here is in the two states, the rank ordering of what they think is a good idea to address climate change. At the top, both Republicans and Democrats prefer regulatory reform, regulations, and the least preferred option for Democrats, Republicans, and independents is cap and trade. Now, anyone who knows Oregon politics right now might find this interesting because cap and trade has, has squashed to Oregon legislative sessions. The Democratic Party in Oregon is really pushing cap and trade, but they might wanna um, look at their own constituency because um, actually, if you look at the Oregon data, it's less than a majority of, or, of, Demo of Democratic affiliators. Democratic people that tell us they're Democrats are, are not in favor of cap and trade, they're in favor of new regulations. Okay, um, so uh, this is just a couple, this is featuring Jay Lee and Paul Manson. Uh, this is at a conference we were in, in Puerto Rico. This is, wait, Jay, this is where hanging out is beautiful back when we could still travel. Um, this is where EVIC is located today. Some of you may recognize this facility. Um, this is Richard Crandall's old shop that um, Reed was generous enough to partner with me to um, renovate this facility. Um, this is where offices are now. So you're welcome to come up and visit us sometime. We've got some nice outside seating. Um, we could meet socially distant. If you'd like to say hello, just drop me a line. Um, this is my team that I work with, uh, Paul Manson, as I said, Reed 01, um, Jay Lee, Reed 19, uh, Canyon Foot, Reed 20. Jane Calderbank uh, is a senior this year, anthropology major. She's been really helping me manage social media. Um, and then Karen Perkins, some of you may know Karen from her time working at Reed, but she's been working uh, as a consultant to kind of, um, we're trying to build relationships with um, nonprofits, provide some new internship opportunities for Reed students, maybe some employment opportunities. I mean, if you know Karen, she's just helping me learn to manage my staff and sort of navigate um, Reed College. So if you have comments or questions, you can of course call, um, email me, you follow me on Twitter, uh, follow us on Facebook, um, if you want to take selfies with me, they're, they all, they sometimes don't look so good. I make strange faces sometimes, but uh, happy to see you talk more. So uh, I should be able to go over here and I should be able to do this. And now I should be able to go over to Zoom. And now I should be able to go to gallery mode. And where's Christine? And it's Q&A time. Hi, Christine. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your talk and also for incorporating um, a little audience participation in, in your thought model. and. Um, nice espresso. I'm going to start with a series of questions in the chat. Um, it's going to feel a little bit mm, like a read conference because we have some questions about your data and your data sets. Sure, Erica, go for it. Okay, anyway. <laughs> um, so the first question um, is from Laura Saunders. Does the way voter registrants uh, register stay associated with the voter through time? So once an AVR, always an AVR? Um, uh, that's a great question. So I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, they, uh, we were able to obtain from the Secretary of State's office, and I didn't show this table, um, the original source of registration. I don't know if on the file we track the transactions. So if you're AVR and then say later you change your address um, using um, the online system, I don't know if that's tracked. Christine, I know you've run for political office. You've probably seen VAN. Do you know, is that on VAN? I'm sorry, VAN is called the Voter Action Network. It's a um, commercial operation, I think would be best described. It's a party operation that takes the Oregon file and then appends other information to it. And I don't know if source of registration is on ban. I suspect you guys don't care. Um, we do. Um, I think that that's stored, but it's hard to get to because that's not typically in the information. So no, once AVR, not always AVR, you can register through various means. I don't know if, we're, if we track that. Yeah, I can say looking at the interfaces that I use, I can get date of last registration. And I sometimes that's when somebody moves. So they look like a new voter, even if they're not a new voter. But I don't get the method um, to which mm -hmm. their file was updated. But again, that's on the consumer side in a database. And I'm sure somewhere you can actually see some code, but it's not used um, by most of those who are doing the voter contact. Um, second question is from Sheldon Ooh, Holkheiser. Sorry if I did, got that wrong. 
uh, what uh, do we know about error in the department in the dependent variable? Are we learning quite a bit about the problems there? How what do we know about error? Problem? What? What do we do about error in the dependent variable? Oh, oh, well, <laughs> so in our dependent variable here, which is voter turnout, um, that data, Sheldon, are um, it's administrative data. So that data, we are very knowledgeable about that data. Um, yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So it's been a transition in my career, actually. I worked um, for most of my career, the first 20 years with survey data and dealing with error, um, survey measurement error was a big issue. Um, this side, we have administrative data. Um, so unless people are not telling the truth in their voter registration materials, um, the data we have are very good, very uh, clean. Um, there isn't much error in the data. The problem is you have limited covariates. Um, you don't know a lot about people otherwise. So for example, um, Sheldon, the, the, so we don't have a lot of error in the turnout data, but to pivot over to the work that Canyon has been doing, um, what he's done there is he's tried to, uh, using uh, geospatial uh, techniques, map from census tracts onto precincts. And there is definitely error there um, because they don't map cleanly and the, the um, ACS, the American Community Survey, is not really designed to produce estimates at the at sort of precise estimates at the level that we are producing them. Um, and so, yeah, how does that disguise the effect there? Well, there, Christine knows this. We've had a lot of interest in that work we've been doing with the daily maps race, but we try to caution people that um, you know, this is sort of a preliminary method um, that we're doing. We're just trying to, it's very suggestive um, that the high income areas are likely the areas, at least the way this race is playing out. High income areas are areas where maps um, will probably pick up Adams's vote. Um, I don't know, Christine, we don't have to go deep into this, but I think that race between maps and Udaly is gonna be one in two areas. Turnout in East Portland, where I suspect uh, Chloe Udaly will do well and turn out in the kind of center, center inner neighborhoods um, that already have high turnout, but these are areas that are likely to lean more toward maps, I think. Yeah, I also think it's gonna be won or lost in turnout of folks who complete their whole ballot versus those who get it in at the very end. And just very good, that's a politician off. speaking. <laughs> You're a down ballot race. <laughs> I'm as low as you can go. Uh, one uh, additional question um, from the esteemed Edward Gronke, who I just want to put a, a note here. Not only is he related to you, um, he's also an incredible public servant in his own right. Happy birthday, Ed. Oh my, and it's his birthday. Um, so question from him. Are you counting address changes of motor vehicle registration as new registration or not? Very good question, Mr. Gronke. So no, we are not, though we do try to examine the impact of address changes. And in fact, some people argue that the biggest contribution of automatic voter registration will come in the address change. Because if your address is changed and a ballot is generated to you, ballot is generated, it's sent to your old address, the ballot is not affordable. So the ballot is sent back to the elections office, then a postcard is generated, that's sent to you, forwarded, and then you have to act on that postcard and fix your address, and then you're able to cast your ballot. And so some say that that is actually the process that will result in the largest address change. Now I can say, Edward, in your state, California, um, they're reporting the address changes as new registrants, and it's not allowing us to partition out address changes from new registration. And that's really critical for trying to understand how AVR, an automatic system, might bring um, new um, new uh, groups into the elect in the electorate. So uh, we're trying to work as a community to get the uh, California to report that data disaggregated. Um, but no, we, we're, we address changes are different than new registrations. And they're very important for us to try to understand what the impact of these systems are. I'm going to scope out a little bit, and we've got a question from Chris Lightgate. Um, what are the national trends in voting participation? Up, down? How do we compare with other nations? Uh, compared to other nations people? is easy. Yeah, we're lousy. We've always been. You know, we're America. Um, we don't vote. <laughs> um, so participation in the United States uh, was quite high in the 75 to 80% rate in the 1880s, 1890s, sort of percolated along, slow trend down throughout most of the 20th century. Um, the most recent peak was in the Kennedy election in 1960, um, 
or I believe it was, it, I think it was at 70% at that point. I might be citing that number incorrectly. And then we had sort of a fairly steep trend downwards um, as many things in this country changed. Um, as we added new uh, people into the electorate, um, which does result in a turnout decline. So um, added 18 year olds, um, that resulted in a drop. Um, and it's been trending along around 50%, but it's been climbing. Um, recently, uh, Barack Obama activated and energized a lot of folks in the electorate uh, in 2008 and 2012. Um, the expectation in 2020 is that we'll have the highest turnout that we've seen since 1960, if not before. Um, in Oregon, I know this number because um, I got it from Steve Trout. Uh, Christine, you may be interested in this number. So the expectation in Oregon is that we will have more ballots returned in 2020 than we mailed out in 2016. That's a combination of ABR and voter energy. So uh, we're on an up, upswing right now. And Chris, actually, um, fo some folks that may, may uh, have heard me say this um, in some of my media appearances. Um, it's what I believe. It's what a lot in my community believe. This election, um, with all the noise about vote by mail, this election is about in-person voting. This election is about sufficient capacity for in-person voting. Um, if, if some of the estimates um, that we're seeing of the number of people that are going to show up to vote in person. Um, the lines we've seen already are nothing. Um, the lines we're seeing now are problematic, but the lines now, at least if you're, if you get out of line for early voting, you can go back in line the next day. But on election day, that's going to be a real problem. And so if we're at 70 or 75% voter turnout in this country and, um, and, and not an insufficient number of people vote early, we, we may have some real long lines on election day. But yeah, turnout's going up this year. It's going to be a big one. Yeah, the second part of the question was if a highly partisan election helps turnout or hurts. Yeah. Uh, well, sadly, a highly competitive election helps turnout. So, and partisanship seems to add to competitiveness. So, competitiveness, um, rancor, there's some disagreement in the literature about what rancor does or what negative campaigning does, um, and whether it's negative or whether it's defining your opponent. Um, you know, I was watching, what we were watching last night. We were watching, you know, TV over the antenna. We were watching local news. Oh my God, the number of ads! I forgot. Uh, Jamie Herrera Butler and Brown. And I mean, do I have to have that many ads about a race in Washington? Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, a partisanship polarization leads to competitiveness, and competitiveness leads to higher turnout. Great, thank you. Here's a question from Anthony Fisher. Why are so many states enamored with voting machines versus the universal mail and balloting? Uh, so there's a couple things going on there um, in that question. So um, let's see. So uh, voting machines. Well, so the, 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 the question on the voting machine side is why some states are still using electronic voting machines. Um, and the reason they're still using them, Georgia, for example, is still using them. The reason they're using them is that we put a lot of we in the last period of rapid reform, which is in 2000, uh, from 2000 to 2004, um, after the 2000 election, everyone thought the greatest solution was going to be a direct recording electronic machines, DREs. Uh, we spent billions of dollars on that, and it turns out they don't work so well. Um, so we're really moving back to paper now, um, and so. Uh, OCR, optical character uh, recognition machines, so you fill out a ballot and slide in the machine. That's where we're going to be and that's where we're going to continue to vote. So that's on the voting machine side. Universal ballot delivery, why are have more states not moved to that? Well, um, some people just don't trust that system. Um, it, it's, I think we're going to have a big move after this year and a lot more system, a lot more states we're down to very few states that require an excuse for an absentee ballot. We have many more states not in a move to no excuse absentee this year. And I think we're gonna see the numbers jump and we may increase the comfort level. To be perfectly frank, when I entered into this field and um, you know, working with Secretary Bill Bradley at, uh, Bradbury at that point, and I have very good relationships with Phil Kiesling, who um, was the Secretary of State when Bopa Mail was first put in place. There was a lot of concern, just that people didn't trust it. They said, yeah, that may work in Oregon, but that ain't working in Jersey. That ain't working in Connecticut. That ain't working in Illinois. Um, and then they adopt the system and it works okay. Um, that's no excuse. Universal ballot delivery is something different. Um, and and I, I will say that it, it's good, in my view, that, that a lot of states did not immediately rush into universal ballot delivery um, in this election. The reason is they're just not ready. Um, it, it takes time to get to where we are. Um, the reason that it works so well in Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Hawaii, Utah, is that 
the system, we partner with the USPS and via the partnership with the USPS, we have a very clean role. So if Christine, for example, moves from where she lived previously to Westland, if she moves, she would typically tell the postal service, but she might not tell the election system. She might forget. But the next time a ballot is generated for any election, the election official gets the update. And then Christine's record is updated. And so we have very clean roles. And so, you know, in New York, for example, the New York, so Canyon Foot working with me looked at the New York registration roles and he said, Paul, he said, I don't understand. There's more people on the registration roll than are in the state of New York, <laughs> over 18. And I said, well, that's because in New York, they traditionally have had in-person voting and they've decided that some deadwood on their rolls is okay. So if New York moved very rapidly to universal ballot delivery, it feeds right into that narrative that you're sending out ballots to people that are living out of state or passed away. So um, I think we might get to universal ballot delivery. Uh, we might. I think where we're going to be is a lot more no excuse absentee balloting nationwide after this election. Great, thank you. So we have about 10 minutes left. I have a wrap up question for you, but one more question from the audience uh, before we get to that. Um, from Dylan Rivera, can you comment how common is voter fraud and does vote by mail compare with electronic voting methods for preventing fraud? Yeah, not this question again. No, Dylan, please. No. Um, look, I've uh, been doing a lot of media work. Folks know that. Um, and I've been um, sort of losing patience um, with people like Dylan ask me these annoying questions. Uh, I'm sorry, I know Dylan. He's a friend. So um, uh, voter fraud is um, minuscule in the United States. Very LOL, yeah. Uh, voter fraud in, in the United States is minimal, uh, tiny, um, hard to track. Uh, there's so little that it's hard to track. It is true that where there are cases with fraud, um, they are more commonly associated with uh, absentee ballots. Um, and that's, to me, uh, uh, it, it's part of that system is that, um, you know, if the ballots leave the hands of election officials, they're out there somewhere, it's potentially the case that someone could grab them. Um, what I do, Dylan, what I uh, send uh, reporters to anyone is I encourage people to go to the Heritage Foundation's website. The Heritage Foundation is a, a conservative think tank um, and they trumpet their voter fraud database. Go there. I've been there. 1,500 cases of voter fraud. First of all, search by absentee balloting, vote by mail, whatever, and, and suddenly you, you lose like 1,200 of the cases, right? Now we've got those ones that are associated with absentee balloting. What do they look like? Virtually every case is 10 ballots here, five ballots there. Somebody that turned out a spouse signed their spouse's ballot. There are no, there are virtually no widespread cases. And the case like NC9, North Carolina 9, that people point to, North Carolina had a really bad system in place to, they don't have ballot tracking. Um, they allow things in the North Carolina law that aren't allowed in Oregon. So if you put the right legal and administrative controls in place, um, vote by mail is actually has less fraud. It's more secure. It's very resilient. If you have people displaced by forest fires, it's very resilient. So the voter fraud thing is a myth. Um, I'll point people to Jim Rudenberg's story that came out in the um, in New York Times Magazine. It helps that a prominent political scientist was quoted in that. Who was that? I don't know. Um, he didn't talk to me. <laughs> actually, he did. But um, And that's a worrisome story because it looks like there were various... Um, groups primarily associated with the Republican Party um, that have been building this voter fraud narrative for about 15 years and getting ready to deploy it. And now we're seeing it in full force. Um, and the place, Dylan, really where I lo really lose patience, I have to say, is this stuff about um, foreign entities counterfeiting ballots. Um, you know, I tried to deal with that. We tried to knock down that story. But when it came up again, this is what I said. I am, uh, it's regrettable that the Attorney General of the United States, the Chief Law Enforcement Official of the United States is actively promoting misinformation that he knows is false. You cannot counterfeit ballots. It can't happen. I won't go through why, but it just can't happen. And so the voter fraud is a myth. It's misinformation. It's trying to sow distrust, lack of faith in our system. And it's just, I'm, it's deeply regrettable that a political party is employing this as part of their campaign. Um, it's just, it's very, very unfortunate. Thanks. That's my day, Christine. I wake up, I'm like, sometimes I literally don't turn on Twitter or email because I want to keep away from this stuff, but yeah, frustrating. I, 
I, I don't turn on Twitter until I'm really angry already. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a wrap up question, but I want to acknowledge there's at least eight questions in the chat that I didn't get a chance to ask you. Some of them asking um, more questions about your data set, some of them being really thoughtful about um, the, the variance between local uh, election officials. Um, there's so much that you've touched on today that is really um, both academically interesting, but really important in the, in the, in the weeks ahead. Hey, I wanted to say one quick thing. Georgia is super interesting, Jim. Georgia is really innovative in some ways, but in other ways they're not. It's just an interesting state. But a lot of these things are people saying, are we counting things away? These are really smart questions. We're, we're trying to do it. It's just the complexities of this. Is, this is exactly why things are so complicated. But anyway, sorry, Christine. So will you take just a few minutes to walk us back through memory lane to 2004 when you got started? How'd you get launched? And then also, I was really excited to see you've got an anthropology major, anthro. Um, on your team. And can you tell us a little bit about the role that uh, postbacks play in your work? Sure, memory lane. Yeah, you know, I, I um, we launched in 2004, um, literally as, as uh, ex-president of Reed College, Colin Dogger once described it as a business card, a letterhead and a lot of chutzpah. And that really was right. Um, you know, we did have a, Eva Kalanis Rosenbaum was in the chat, help, help and uh, James Hicks, uh, Eva now, um, it works for a, non, a, a communications nonprofit firm down in San Francisco. James Hicks, I think, is finishing a JD PhD. I think he may be done at Berkeley. Um, but they really worked with me in partnership first um, as I, I think Ducey, and I might have funded Eva originally as a Corbett, um, but then they ended up being postbacks, which is really critical for me. Um, but we launched in 2004 because there was a space in the field. People, it may be hard for people to realize, but back at that point, um, nobody was looking at early voting or vote by mail. I sort of had that feel to myself. Lots of people were doing voting machines. Lots of people were looking, look, looking at the changing of voter registration, but nobody was looking at early voting. So I sort of established a presence in that space. Um, Eva and James were critical on working with me to get funding from the Pew, um, Pew Center in the States, Pew Charitable Trusts. That allowed me to fund Eva and James as postbacks. Um, if you look at my publication trajectory, you'll see that I had a spike when I got um, Eva and James on board, then I was able to get Peter Miller on board, I think as a Corbett, again, a summer Corbett. Um, and then Peter went on to get a PhD at UC Irvine. Peter now works at uh, the Brennan Center. Um, he's one of the leads nationally on making sure we have a free and fair and equitable redistricting process. And after 2020, um, you know, Michael Richardson, who worked with me, I think uh, he had a Ducey and then a Corbett, Dan Toffey, who um, had a Ducey Corbett. Um, so it was really critically important for me in those early years. I got, I had support, frankly, from um, Reed funds. Um, Reed uh, summer research funds, the Silman Drake fund during the year allowed me to fund my research at a level where I was unable to garner any kind of uh, grant support. Um, then I was able to kind of tap into this um, private foundation money stream. Um, and that allowed me to fund it a post backs which then allowed me to compete better for more money. Um, so really those early years were tough and things would go up and down. You know, when the money would dry up, I would, I would reduce down to a single person shop. Um, so we kind of struggled through four to 12, uh, eight to 12 was sort of a light period, but then we had a spike up again after 2016, um, not surprisingly. Um, so, you know, I, I uh, and post backs well, yeah. Postbacks are an interesting thing at Reed. Um, you know, Christine, you and I have talked about this before. So students in our division in uh, history and social sciences often don't come to their majors until um, their third year. Um, and so by the time they get trained um, and get to the point where they can really contribute and collaborate, um, they're seniors and then they're working on their theses. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had, uh, I've had great students that I've worked with all the way through and we try to identify promising students early on in their career, but I've had some of my best success working with students as postbacks. Um, the challenge with postbacks is, is it's expensive. I want to pay people a living wage. Uh, Eva may remember I, I had her employed at half time so I could pay her benefits, but that's extremely costly. Um, I've been, uh, Democracy Fund has been generous enough now that I'm able to employ both Canyon and Jay. 
um, with something approaching a full-time salary, but that gets really expensive. So um, what I'm trying to do here is build on the social sciences, a model that's sort of like what you see over in biology and chemistry in those fields where they have a continuing infrastructure and then faculty can enter in and out. That's what I'm trying to help with Chris and uh, Paul Manson through environmental studies to sort of build this infrastructure so we can have that infrastructure so faculty can enter in um, without the need to do what I did, which is you know ramp up really, really quickly um, and, and try to go out there and, and be chasing money all the time, which, you know, you know this, Christy, it's tiring to always be chasing money. Um, but it's been great. Uh, Reese House has been wonderful. The administration has been incredibly supportive of my work. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's been a good run. Um, if I could just make it through November 4th. <laughs> you and me both. Well, thank you so much. It has been wonderful hearing you um, talk about this work in context of what we're all seeing. Um, in elections across the country. Yeah, and I hope everybody uh, has a great weekend, continues to engage with Reed. There's a lot of excitement. I think student alumni connections are so important here. And, and I've always thought of the alumni in many ways as, as an incredible resource, but one that there's so, so much more potential um, if we can connect alumni with students uh, and students are really thirsting right now for guidance, mentoring, these kinds of things. So um, yeah, please stay engaged. I know it's hard right now, but we'll get through this. Absolutely, we will. And I think Reed's gonna be stronger for it. So thanks. Thank you.